In that case, then, we're going to start off with uh, OneSearch. OneSearch is the large uh, box prominently placed, and it will be even more prominent on the new website. OneSearch searches about 80% of everything in the library. This includes books, DVDs, um, and journal articles. And as such, it's a great way to start your research. It's a great way to get the lay of the land, to see what's out there, and to start revising your search. Okay? Um, so, let me begin by asking you for a topic to search on. It doesn't have to be a perfect topic because part of this is also revising a, uh, revising a search, pulling out keywords, and seeing what we can do with it. So, let's have somebody have a, give us a topic that's related to food. Um, nothing just that specific to the University of Mississippi, if you don't mind. We're, we'll, we'll broaden our minds a little bit, especially since uh, kids in Florida may be seeing this. Okay. I believe that's what GMO stands for. And then we're looking at them not just in general, but in terms of the food supply, right? So we'll add the word food in there. And then we'll see what we get. This is important. Um, if you're using this from home, and I imagine that most of you will be, um, this is different from the way OneSearch used to be. The first time you enter a search, you will be asked to enter your web ID and password. So do be sure that those are up to date through my own this. Okay. So you'll notice that we have about 181,000 results to begin with, which makes sense. We've done a very broad search. And uh, the search screen is divided into basically three places. We have search refinements over here that we can use to limit our results. We have our results in the middle. And then on the right, there's absolutely nothing, but we will fill that space in just a moment. So the first thing I want to show you guys is how to use some search limiters to narrow down the number of results that you've got quickly so that you can see how you can revise your search and um, whether or not the results that you're getting are accurate or not. These limits here are generally going to be the first place you want to come. Full text is a good one, not because full text is inherently better, it'll cut out all, most of our books for example, but because it is um, a good way to very quickly be able to tell if your source is accurate by reading it. And obviously for our distance students, full text is a necessity since they won't be able to get any of, of our books quickly. Scholarly and peer-reviewed journals is also an excellent one to use because this allows you to very quickly narrow things down to the more scholarly types of titles that often have some of the best types of research. Okay? And then finally, if we scroll down here, you'll see that we have additional source types. We can pop these out if we want. For instance, if you're getting a lot of results that aren't in English, you can choose English. And there are some subject terms here that you can use um, in additional searches that have just been pulled together by the algorithm. But if we do a search for uh, peer-reviewed journals, we should make sure to also click on academic journals here, which will cut out reviews and other things that aren't really part and parcel of what we're looking for. All right. So, we've got 49,000 articles, which is still probably too many, but it's enough to let us start seeing how effective our search terms have been and what we can do to revise them. So, we're looking at risk perception and willingness to buy GM products. I'm guessing that they mean genetically modified and not General Motors. Um, the FDA should step up to the regulatory plate. Ooh, some uh, stuff about labeling. It looks like we've, we've got some stuff that is highly relevant at least to the search that we enter. <coughs> now we can look at some of these articles individually and start pulling out things that we can use to make a better search or to revise our topic. For instance, um, genetically modified organisms in food is impossibly broad. We should narrow that down a little bit. And these can give us some ideas for doing so. For instance, this second one here, genetically modified food fight. <laughs> if we click on the title, 
We'll get some additional information about the article, as well as some terms that we can use to launch new searches. These terms here will link you to other articles that are on the same topic. So if we were interested in genetically modified foods labeling law and legislation, we can click that through, or we can copy and paste it in for a new search. We also have an abstract here. Does anyone know what an abstract is other than a Picasso hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art? Nobody? Nobody knows what an abstract is? Okay. Allow me to enlighten you then. An abstract is a one paragraph summary of the paper that was provided by the author. It serves two purposes. First, it allows you to very quickly see what the article is about. And second, it allows you to very quickly see if the article is relevant to what you're searching for. This allows you to save precious time by not reading the whole article, by not skimming the whole article, just by reading the abstract. You can tell whether or not it's going to be valuable to you. And in this case, this is an intriguing thing because it's talking about um, legal aspects of genetically modified foods and organisms, um, talking about laws and regulations that have been implemented in 60 countries, and then a ballot measure to label GMOs that failed in California in 2012. So this suggests a way to refine our topic so that it not only takes the form of a research paper but the form of an argument that, that we are presenting to the reader. We could say, we believe that genetically modified foods should be labeled and here's why. Or perhaps we believe that genetically labeled foods should not be labeled, and here's why. So there are some tools on the uh, right here. Remember I told you that we would fill that useless space with something. There's a citation button right here that allows you to bring up a list of citations in various and sundry citation formats. For this class you're using MLA, but you'll see that there's also APA, Chicago Turabian, which is the most fun to say out of all of them, I'm sure you'll agree. There. So in this case, you have the full citation there, and if you wanted to, you can copy it, paste it into your uh, Works Cited page, and uh, go from there. Now, I don't know if you can uh, read it in the back, but there is a disclaimer here telling you that you need to double check these citations because you have to remember that these are being assembled by a heartless computer. These are being put together by Skynet. So um, it's been known to make terrible mistakes. Typically you'll want to look for, as it says, personal names and capitalization. Often the person's name will be formatted incorrectly, their first name will be first and their last name will be last. And you'll have to correct that uh, manually. Also sometimes everything will be in giant capital letters. You'll obviously want to correct that as well because I know you guys are excited about writing these papers but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to shout your citations off the page. Also there's an email button right here which allows you to email this article to yourself. This gives you all the benefits of the citation tab I just showed you if we click citation format and change it to MLA but with the added benefit of sending you an email that has as an attachment the full text of the article, as we'll see in a moment, and a link which will bring you back to this very page within the library system. So it does three things at once. The only thing it doesn't do is um, slice and dice your julienne fries. Um, we have come across a bug with this interface and some of our other email interfaces where occasionally you'll hit send and it will tell you that there's an error. Um, we're still working on nailing that down, but I will tell you that most of the time that error message is a filthy liar and your email actually has gone through. So if you do get that message, check your email to make sure that you haven't actually gotten it before you contact us with a bug report. Um, I suppose it bears repeating that this is, um, as of right now, a new product. We've only had it since January and so we are experiencing some bugs. Um, we're not quite in an Amazon rainforest level of bugginess, but we're definitely up there in terms of the Congo. So if you do run across anything that does not seem to be working properly, please let us know via that Ask a Librarian as soon as you possibly can, both so that we can help you get your uh, research done 
and so that we can address the bugs on our end to provide a better user experience for you guys. Now we had the option of clicking on the full text link in the previous screen, but you can also do it from here. For most computers and in most browsers, it will open up in a window here that will allow you to preview the entire um, article. You'll notice that we still have our tools over here that allow us to uh, send and cite. And we can download using this button or this download PDF. And then we can scroll through the PDF in order to have a look. You'll notice that it um, has all of the formatting that it would have originally had on the written page. Since it's a law document, you'll see that it has um, more footnotes than a millipede. Um, and it's basically put together in the same way that it would be if you were reading it on the page. Now, it also bears repeating that just like you guys, the authors of this article have to cite their sources. These are cited in a law format, but that doesn't, necess but that doesn't mean that they um, are any less useful to them. But one of the best ways to do your research is to find a good article on a subject that you are interested in and then steal their citations find those articles, read them, and cite them yourself. This is actually how a lot of your professors do their research. And even though I'm using words like steal, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. All right, so let's say that we like this article here, but we want to do a further search. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, I'm not trying to write your paper for you, that we've decided to talk strictly about labeling and whether or not um, these genetically modified products should be labeled. So if we find something that we like, we can click on the folder plus icon like so, and it will add it to a temporary folder for us. Then we can try a new search, labeling, put that through, and then um, the uh, items that we found before are still in our folder. Notice too that all of our limiters from this first group here above the publication date line have been preserved. So we're still searching only for full text and still searching only for scholarly and peer-reviewed journals. However, we do have to go back down below the line to change it back to academic journals once again. If you decide incidentally that you don't want any of these limiters to be added, if you decide that uh, you've had it with them, it's time to spend some time apart, time to see other limiters, you can click on the little blue X and that will remove it. If at any time you decide to get back together with that limiter, if you decide that um, you really want to make things work, you can click on it down here to put it back on. But I really suggest that you use the uh, system in the way that we've been using it. Try out different searches, try out different search terms, and most importantly, pull new terms and new ideas, not only for your searches, but also for your topic, from the results that you get. Put whatever you like or whatever you think looks interesting into your folder as you're doing your searching. And then you can very quickly assemble a nice pot of articles that you can set aside to read later on. If we go to folder view, which you can do here or here, you can see what's in your folder. And you'll see that we have a limited version of the, uh, the menu over here with the ability to email items to yourself. This email interface is essentially the same as the one I showed you a moment ago. The difference is that it, it is for your whole folder. So if you have 20 articles in there, you will get an email with 20 articles. You guys all have Gmail accounts, so hopefully you'll have enough space. And just like before, you can set it to the citation format of your choice. One bug that we have noticed with this is that I'm sure you noticed the send button just appeared there a few seconds after I uh, came to the page. It is very often tardy. Um, it's, prob it's final grade in the course is probably going to suffer because of that. But if you're impatient and you don't want to wait for the send button to show up, you can enter your email address here and then simply hit enter and it will send the email once again. And as I said before, if you come across that bug that tells you your email could not be sent, there's a good chance that it's messing with you and that it actually did send the email.
One thing that I will add about your folder is that your folder is temporary. If you leave this page or if you allow it to idle for too long, the contents of your folder will be destroyed forever by robots. So um, do make sure that when you're finished with your research or when you're at a stopping point that you email the contents of your folder to yourself if they're actually something you're interested in. If you're worried about not having a uh, persistent folder, if that's the kind of thing that wakes you up at night in a cold sweat, you can use this sign-in button here to create an account with our database vendor that will give you a folder that persists between sessions and even between databases, as I'll talk about in a minute, when you're signed in. Um, that's completely independent of the University of Mississippi. You'd have to sign in with a new username and password, but it does provide an additional level of security if that's something that you're interested in. So, that said, does anyone have any questions about using OneSearch? Again, this is a good place to start. About 80% of the library stuff is in here. And um, it's very easy to get an overview and be able to uh, find information that you can use to revise your topic and your search. Okay. Your keen, glassy-eyed stares tell me that, uh, that we're moving in the right direction and that we've got good comprehension. So I'm going to go ahead and click this off, and we'll move on.